Good morning. It is my delight to be back in your pulpit today. Thank you so much for the gracious invitation to have me here. It is a glorious day because God has called us to this place and to this time. We are a gathering that is unique. We have never been this way together before, even though you have been together. But it is a new day, and we will not be together this way again. Because God's spirit right now, right here, is working new things among us. And the next time you gather, that will also be true. And so we come and we open up our hearts. We give thanks for each other, but particularly we give thanks for the unique way that God's spirit moves among us. No matter whether we're confident in our faith or questioning in our faith, no matter whether our week has been just full of joys and excitement or full of challenges, God welcomes you here just as you are today and just as you will be as you grow in faith. I welcome you. Then let us gather ourselves in worship with our uh, responsive invitation, which is found in your bulletin. O oh God, you summon the day to dawn, you teach the morning to waken the earth. Praise your name, praise your Lord. For you the valleys shall sing for joy, the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Praise your name, praise your Lord. For you the monarchs of the earth shall bow, the poor and persecuted shall shout for joy. Your love and mercy shall last forever, fresh as the morning, sure as the sunrise. We gather in worship to affirm your great love, great And let us worship together with our opening hymn, number 28, For the Beauty of the Earth. Let us pray together our opening prayer. We confess to you, O oh God, that we have used only a small part of the potential that is in us. There are energies, powers, and possibilities in us that have never been released. 
Forgive us for settling for second best, for growing accustomed to the way we think and act, and then failing to go beyond our usual responses. Help us to yield to you this day, and thus to open our lives once more to your joy, service, and adventure, made possible through the embracing forgiveness of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And it is this same Christ who leads us and supports us and has taught us to pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. the children coming down for the children's message. I was told I had to do this. Not the children's message, the microphone. I thought this was just a private conversation with you guys. Well, I think I'm going to hold it. I'm here today, and I haven't done this in a long, long time, probably 20 years. But Kirsten, who was coming to do the children's message, her mom hurt her hand this morning, and they had to go to the emergency room and get it x-rayed. So we're all saying prayers that her mother's hand is going to be um, OK, but might have to have a cast on it for a little while. So she shared with me that her message today was about John 9. And it's a story of um, Jesus healing a blind man's sight. But the kind of beginning part of the story and why I want to kind of concentrate on is it's more about the people around them thought that the reason the man was blind was because he had sinned. And they were thinking that bad things happen to people that sin and good things happen to people that don't. And one of the things we need to, to understand from, from God and from Jesus is that he doesn't make things happen to us, but he's always there with us as we walk through all the things that go wrong. So if you think back in your life, can you think of things that were, that terrible things happened? Like I can remember breaking my leg, falling out of a tree. I mean, has anything ever happened? Did you ever hurt yourself? You were scared. Always keep in mind that God is with you while you walk that path. But he's not there. He doesn't make people get sick and he doesn't make people get healthy. He just is there to walk with you and go through that time of trial. And that's kind of very important. So sometimes when you're scared, or when I was little, and I used to be scared under my covers because I got to a point where my mom wouldn't let me go to bed with the light on, probably because I was reading in bed till midnight. But I can remember her always telling me, just sit there and just say a prayer to God, and he's with you. And it, it helps, because sometimes if you think about it and you feel God with you, and you just in your heart know that he's there, it makes things less scary. Sometimes it can help you get through times there have been times in my life where we've had, um, you know, deaths and children in the hospital. And my older daughter was in the hospital for a while. And I can remember just having that prayer and just feeling really deeply in my heart and knowing that, that, that I could feel his arms kind of wrap around me and be with me. So just keep that in your mind going forward today. Um, I think you're kind of, kind of split up between Megan and Cindy for Sunday school. And we'll say a quick prayer to end. Dear Lord, walk with us today as you do always. Keep us safe and warm 
but always let us know that you're by our side, even when times are difficult, um, that you were there to take care of us. Amen. Thank you. God's generosity to us overflows, and as part of our worship and our devotion, we are called to give a portion of the blessings that God has first given to us back to God, that they might be blessings to others. You have a basket in the back and a basket here for your offerings. Let us stand for our doxology. Whatever we give you, O God, is but a small reflection of the bounty you have bestowed on us. Teach us generosity with all we have, including our love and praise, that we may live abundantly in the spirit of Christ. Amen. Please be seated. As we come before God in this time of worship, it is right that we also gather ourselves in prayer and I would ask, are there any joys or concerns that you would like to share today? Please leave a comment or send us an email with your joys and concerns, and we will pray for you. Other prayers. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Gracious and loving God, by your spirit, enter into our hearts with your steadfast and sustaining grace. Transform us from people who live unto ourselves into people who live in your light. Remake us from people who are closed into people who are champions of justice, mercy, and forgiveness. We come wanting to be more than we are, hoping we can become more than we are, desiring to be the best we can be in your sight. Lord, hear our prayers. Today we bow our heads and offer our hearts to you and our hearts that carry both joys and concerns. We lift up to you those who are grieving, those who are laying loved ones into your arms. O oh Lord, be with them. We pray for people who are in need of healing. And so, Lord, we ask that all people in need of healing might know that you are with them to walk the pathway. We give thanks for relationships that continue and endure, and we give thanks also when we can gather together and celebrate life and celebrate your grace and mercy with us. There are many other things in our hearts, O oh Lord, and we pause in this moment of silence to lift to you our joys and our concerns. O oh Lord, this day we pray for ourselves. In this season of Lent, we examine who we are in your sight, and we recognize that you have given us a gift far beyond what we deserve, but that we so much need. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, your promises of hope, peace, and grace are made possible for us. You have loved us in spite of our shortcomings and in spite of our struggles. Made strong through your gift of your Son, we are now free to be your people, not consumed with ourselves, but concerned for others who need a helping hand, a friendly word, a hopeful touch, a hot meal, a shelter. Thank you for releasing us from preoccupation and freeing us for service to your name. In all things, Lord, walk with us that we might not lose the way of your love, Stay with us that we might not forget your enduring presence in our lives. And abide with us that we might live in service to you all the days of our lives. 
All of this we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our sermon lesson today comes from the Gospel of Matthew. I'm reading in the 13th chapter, verses 1 through 23. Hear now these words. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly um, since they had no depth of soil. They withered. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Then the disciples came and asked him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to those who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. The reason I speak to them in parables is that seeing they do not perceive, and hearing they do not listen, nor do they understand. With them, indeed, is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah that says, You will indeed listen, but never understand. And you will indeed look, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes so they might not look with their eyes and listen with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, your ears, for they hear. Truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word but cares, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case, a hundredfold, another sixty, and in another thirty. May these ancient words of scripture become for us the living word of God. Amen. It happens every spring. After the cold of winter, the blowing snow, the icy sun of day, and the frigid moon of night, it happens. That first whispering warmth, the sighting of a robin, and all of a sudden, my soul cries out, oh, it's time to work the garden. It's time to get out there and do it. (laughs) My dreams of gardening are as big as the winter has been long. Tomatoes, peas, beans, cucumbers, ooh, beets and carrots. 
And if it's been a particularly cold, long winter, I might even think parsnips and Brussels sprouts, and that's when I know the winter has been too long. So I always begin enthusiastically. I grab the spading fork in preparation for turning over the fresh spring soil, and immediately I hand it to my husband, Paul. <laughs> I say, here, honey, let's spend some quality time together. I'll be the cheerleader. And so when we are ready to plant the seeds, the freshly turned soil is dark and moist, and there is not a weed in sight. And we plant neat, straight, tidy rows. And as the spring warms up, you know, Paul and I tiptoe into the garden looking for those first tender shoots. Any gardeners here? Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> I get so excited when those shoots break the soil. And if there is one weed in early competition, I zealously pluck it out. And then it happens. Spring turns into summer. The sun heats the soil, the rain nurtures the plants, and I get caught up in a busy summer schedule, and the whole thing gets away from me. Okay? Weeds and vegetables, they intertwine into a gigantic jumble. Right? I need a machete to find the beans, and all I can do is admire the beautiful purple flowers of vetch that carpet and completely smother my sweet onions. And that pesky rabbit, that provoked so much unchristian thought in my head, not a month earlier, well, seems cute now, and my Christian charity returns. I mean, have at it, bunny. So now our scripture lesson today always reminds me of these ups and downs of gardening. The Hebrews of Jesus' Palestine would have known all about gardening and farming, so Jesus, as he does so often, uses their everyday knowledge to craft a parable or a short story that teaches a moral or spiritual lesson. Jesus is talking to a crowd of people, disciples and village folk alike, maybe even people from far away who were curious about who this Jesus is. All we know is that it is a crowd, and they're gathered on the beach at the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus gets into a boat from which he teaches them many things. And among them, this parable of the sower. And you know this very familiar story. You know, the sower goes out to sow, and as he sowed, some of the seed fell on the path, uh, and the birds came and ate the seed. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, no depth of soil. They spring up quickly, but they don't have a deep enough root, so they wither up. Um, some seeds fell where there were also weed seeds, like my garden, right? And the thorns grow up and they choked the good seed. But the seed that fell on the fertile ground, ah, the harvest was plentiful, 30, 60, 100 fold. Now, versions of this parable can be found in Mark and Luke as well as Matthew. And in all three cases, the disciples ask Jesus what it means. And why does he speak in parables? So among other things, Jesus tells his disciples that the seeds represent people, some of whom get it, right? And some of whom don't get it. And by get it, I mean the spiritual realities of life. For us as readers, it begs the question, well, if that's the case, if seeds are people, what kind of seed am I? In fact, let's admit it. Many of us have heard more than one sermon that admonishes us to be the seeds that fall on good soil and bear fruit. Am I right? Have you heard that sermon before? Yeah, yeah, I've probably even preached one or two of those in the past. Um, this approach is so obvious, it's hard to understand why the disciples had to ask for an explanation. But I, for one, harbor a secret fear that maybe I'm not one of the good seeds. I mean, I want to be, right? But how can I really be sure if I'm in good soil? Now, has anyone else worried about this, or is this just me being nervous and you've some, I guess, some head nodding, yeah? <laughs> so when Paul and I lived in Michigan before coming back here, uh, we planted an absolutely gorgeous garden, which included four tomato seedlings, right? They were beautiful. Over the course of two months, the plants got tall and bushy. They were the best-looking tomato plants I had ever seen. 
They were big and lush, and they began to flower profusely, getting ready to set fruit. I love tomatoes, and I was already planning on how to use this bountiful harvest. And then overnight, when I went into the garden in the fresh of the morning, one of the plants was shriveled almost to nothing. In the course of the same day, the others did the same. It turns out the walnut trees in our yard exude a toxin into the soil, killing the plants just at the point of setting fruit. Beautiful, dark, moist, and poisoned soil. Just how do you know what kind of soil you're in until it's too late? I mean, what happens if I come to so big a crisis in my life that I lose faith, as if it has been snatched away when I need it most and I wither up? What happens if I lose myself in the teachings of the world? And you know those teachings, that success is measured by beauty and wealth and entitlement. What happens if I forget that God values character and generosity and humility? Boy, it's a constant temptation to buy into the values of the world. I mean, I've heard stories about pastors who find themselves in such conflict in a church that their faith collapses and they leave ministry for good. And I've known parishioners who have walked out of the church and away from God because they don't understand how Christians can treat each other so poorly. I mean, I haven't had these experiences, but, but what if? Would I shrivel up and lose my faith in the process? Yep, I've heard more than one sermon that wants me to worry about what kind of seed I am, and quite frankly, I've obliged. But I don't think that God wants us to be living in constant worry either. I mean, constant worry snatches the good news of God right away from us. Now, when I was a pastor in Maine, a week after Easter, all the area clergy got together for lunch. Uh, Spring was setting in after a particularly long, hard, cold winter. Church budgets, which were already bare bones, had suffered a huge hit in heating costs. The price of oil that year had skyrocketed. And you know what colonial churches are like, right? Colonial New England churches, these big windows, and, you know, there's nothing there to keep the heat in. And so, uh, yeah. So all my colleagues could do was wring their hands and worry. The good news of the resurrection that we had just celebrated was nowhere to be found among them. Who can rejoice in God's hope and joy when we're constantly worried? So I want us to refocus this parable. I think the overlooked part of this parable is the sower. Who is this sower who is so reckless in sowing, so extravagant and exuberant and unconcerned where all those seeds are scattered? And that is so unlike me, who reads the seed package. Space seeds evenly, a quarter inch deep, one inch apart, and rows that are at least 12 inches apart. I have a little ruler, right? This is not our biblical sower, Uh uh-uh. Those seeds go everywhere. They go on the pathway, on the rocky, unprepared soil, into the weeds, as well as where the earth is fertile. In my previous position, the one I was doing in Michigan, I worked with a lot of churches that are worried these days. They look around and wonder why there are no young people in church. The average age of the congregation is increasing while the resources are decreasing. Parishioners begin to fight among themselves and assign blame. It's the pastor's fault, or it's the fault of those coaches who scheduled practices on Sunday, or it's the fault of a different church down the road or in the next town over. Or church members wring their hands in despair, but are too afraid to try something different for fear of upsetting people. Their pastors read how-to books, searching for the right formula, the proper way of doing things, right? Space seeds evenly, a quarter inch deep, one inch apart in rows that are at least 12 inches apart. But but what if the church is supposed to be like the sower? What if the church is supposed to be extravagant and exuberant and unconcerned about where the seeds are scattered? 
Those listening to Jesus would have equated the sower with a teacher or preacher. It was a common image in Hellenistic circles. And today, as the church, we are the legacy of the teachings of Jesus Christ. We are the sowers. What if the church is supposed to be like the sower? Extravagant and exuberant and unconcerned about where the seeds are scattered. And speaking of pastors reading books, I picked up a book, appropriately enough, <laughs> titled Scattering Seeds, Creating Church Vitality. Yeah. Um, but it was written by a pastor named Stephen Chapin Garner and Jerry Thornell. And Garner at that time was the minister of a United Church of Christ Church in Norwell, Massachusetts. He began his ministry there with all kinds of notions about church growth and success, and boy, he was going to go in there and do it. This was going to be a turnaround church, and he was just going to be the one to do it. And over the course of time, he discovered that the best laid plans often produced unintended and quite unexpected results. What he thought would work absolutely didn't. But then something else sprung up altogether as a result of the efforts. Things that were unique to the congregation, that's what sprung up things that were unique to the community in which they resided. He learned that there is no one-size-fits-all church. There is no patented formula for growth. There is no standard model of ministry that will work well for every community. And he discovered the liberating truth of this reality is that we don't need to worry about that megachurch in our backyard. We don't need to provide a spiritual buffet to meet everyone's needs all the time. We simply must be willing to sow seeds wherever they land and let the Holy Spirit take it from there. He says, I admit in doing this, we must be willing to embrace the unpredictable, and be comfortable living with uncertainty. Throwing seeds all over the place and praying for growth may seem like madness, particularly if you're the one doing the sowing. You may lose 75% of the seeds you have scattered, but the increase from the remaining 25% is 30, 60, 100 times what you might expect. In refocusing this parable on the sower, I think we also have some permission to reconsider the seeds. Okay? The seeds God gives to us to scatter are amazing. They are seeds of hope and joy and comfort. Seeds of assurance, love, peace, and good news. I mean, oh my, why wouldn't we want to sow those seeds as broadly and as widely as possible? Let's take some risk, try new things, adjust our attitudes, and quit worrying about if we're doing it right, and ask instead, are we doing it as generously and joyfully as possible? And if we are, we may just be surprised at what takes root and grows in our church garden. The Holy Spirit will tend to it, but we must be willing to sow, sow, sow. We must cast these seeds so that they fall on everyone we can reach. Lawyer and waitress, well-heeled and homeless, gay and straight, sinner and saint, the curious and the oblivious, the convinced and the skeptical, the hopeless and the happy. We don't know where those seeds will take deep root and thrive but we don't need to. We simply must be the unique church that God intended us to be in this time and in this place and sow the seeds God asks us to. So as the gathered body of Christ dare to be extravagant sowers of God's hope, joy, comfort, assurance, love, peace, and good news, you do not know where those seeds will fall or when they will bear fruit. But in those seeds is the essence of life for you, for me, and for the church that God is calling you to be. 
Amen. Our closing hymn is an insert in your bulletin, We Plow the Fields and Scatter. as you go into this world, know that you are sowers of God's seeds, those seeds that offer hope and love and joy and comfort, the very essence of life. Sow those seeds broadly and joyfully wherever you go. And now may the love of God and the peace of his son, Jesus Christ, and the joy of the Holy Spirit be with you forevermore. Amen. Amen.